Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Chemistry Revamped. Let's get started on today's episode on nanobots, assembly and biology. Since last time we already covered how chemistry can be used to mimic biology, today let's get into how chemistry can actually be used to describe biology. So let's start with the very, very fundamental unit of an organism, the cell. The cell is composed of proteins, organelles, and nucleic acids, which are instructions to how to build the rest of those things. So how was the entire cell put together again? How, how was it that, okay, like the nucleic acids stay in the nucleus, how does the protein know where to go, etc, etc. So the answer to that, well, could it be a bunch of robot arms? Small robot arms that assemble things together. Well, the answer to that would actually be no. Here's why. It's because we happen to have 30 trillion of these things inside of our bodies, and they're of different types as well. So how? Re really, how do we actually make an organism or something along the lines of that? Let's zoom out, or rather, actually, let's zoom really far in. Let's go into the deep physics of it again. Particles, elements, uh, fundamental particles, you know, elemental particles, quarks, gluons, etc. Well, some of these have a property called charge. And when opposite charges are present, they attract each other. So why does it do this? Well, that's because a charge, charges have a property where they can influence something called an electric field. These lines coming out of the positive charge are called electric fields. And you can imagine as these fields being like iron filings around a magnet, except well not just the mag not just like uh, the orientation, it also tells you the direction it's pointing in. Charges influence the electric field. For example, positive charges push outward. Notice when you move the charge, the electric field doesn't actually move. It stays where it stays. It only changes the value and the direction that's pointing. When, say, let's go on the reverse situation here with the negative charge. The field actually points toward the negative charge. Another property of the electric field is that when an external electric field is present, Positive charges move along the field lines, and negative charges do the opposite. So now we have two key properties. Charges emit electric fields, and fields influence charge. So now let's see what happens beneath the surface of that attraction we saw earlier. So as you can see, the charges generate the fields, and the charges then move along the fields that the other one has generated. So that's a complete picture of how charges attract each other. It's through the electric field. So in chemistry, you usually don't have protons or gluons or quarks, so actually gluons don't have charge. Quarks or whatnot hanging around, well, they're mostly storing atoms. And you can actually make atoms go charged in positive or negative directions, respectively. You can do that by either removing an electron, giving it a positive charge, or giving it more electrons, making it negatively charged. 
So now that we have a more deeper picture of charges, let's get into a more complex form of interaction, dipolar forces. In chemistry, not every element is made equally. Some like electrons more than others, and some really do hate electrons. This affinity for electrons is described by a number called electronegativity. And you can actually look this number up in the periodic table, with fluorine being the most electronegative element. So say we bond hydrogen to an oxygen. The hydrogen has less electronegativity than oxygen, so the oxygen would hog electrons to itself. These delta signs that you see here indicate how oxygen is partially negatively charged and hydrogen is partially positively charged. This property right here is called polarity, since it's sort of like a magnetic pole, except we have positive poles and negative poles instead of north and south poles. As you can see here, the electrons are more attracted towards the hydrogen and repelled by the oxygen. A really good example of a dipole would be water. Gl alcohol, glucose, nucleotides, amino acids, and so on and so forth. So say we have a bunch of boiling molecules together. They'll be attracted in this fashion. The partially negative oxygen would be drawn towards the partially positive ox hydrogen. This particular form of dipole force, where hydrogen is involved in making the dipole, is called hydrogen bonding. So what about nonpolar substances? Say we have two atoms together. Of course, there's heat, and therefore atoms vibrate. And during this vibration, the nucleus may shift back slightly, and a very, very partial charge is generated. This particular form of force is called the van der Waals force, and this force is actually one of the most important forces out there. Say, if we try to approach the white atom with towards the gray atom, it actually bounces off. Why? So, if we plot an energy graph next to the gray atom, when the white atom approaches the gray atom, it gets repelled as soon as the energy curves up. But when it gets far away, it gets pulled back as soon as it leaves. This sweet spot where it doesn't get pushed or get pulled is called the van der Waals radius. And to nail this point home, let's take a look at a molecular dynamic simulation of helium at 2 Kelvin. So, if you run this uh, animation at this particular temperature, the helium would be gradually drawn closer and closer and closer together. Until it forms a helium superfluid, as you can see here. Notice that it actually never passes through the shell. It's because this shell actually labels where the van der Waals radius is. So this is the reason why atoms don't suddenly pass through each other. It's because it, there is a van der Waals repulsion between them. However, this force isn't as strong as those two. So just some heat could really push them apart. Though there is some attraction as you can see in some points in this simulation, it's not strong enough to pull this entire gas back into the fluid. So this is the reason why last time we had to heat shock the Fringa motor. It's to get over the barrier created by those methyl groups, and this type of barrier is called this steric hindrance. It's caused by the van der Waals force. So what does all of this have to do with biology exactly? Well, inside of cells, we have a very, very important organelle, and it's a cell membrane. If we don't have it, the, all the contents would spill out of the cell. 
The membrane is made from a molecule called a phospholipid. There are two parts to this. There is a polar cap and there is the non-polar tail to it. And it's arranged in such a way where the tail is always pointing inwards. So if you actually dump a bunch of these into water, the polar side will be attracted towards water by the dipole-dipole force. And the non-polar sides will be attracted together by the van der Waals force. And this right here is called self-assembly. Molecules need really no one to tell them where they need to go. They just know where they need to go because the forces between them tell them so. So as you can see in the background here, it begins to form this phospholipid bilayer. So now that we know how stuff is built, let's take the time to really really appreciate this ability in its fullest form. Well, proteins. Let's take a look at the big guns here, the protein. Proteins are originally in the form of long chains, and each individual chain is a molecule called an amino acid. With different interaction styles, it could be charge attraction, hydrogen bonding, or the van der Waals force. And this is basically how a protein gains its shape and hence functionality. It's just a bunch of forces attracting and repelling each other. Another really important biology process is the ability to replicate DNA. We as humans are really, really great at modifying things, right? So we basically copied nature and made our own. And this is called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. But before we get into the nooks and crannies of PCR, we gotta know what DNA is made of first. DNA is made from four molecules. They're called deoxynucleotides. There's adenine, cytidine, thymine, and guanosine. And these are joined together inside of the DNA by hydrogen bonding, A with T and G with C, since they have the equivalent amount of hydrogen bonding. So the first step in PCR would be denaturing, heating the DNA to around 90 degrees C, and this breaks the hydrogen bonds, separating it into two separate stands. Next, a single-stranded nucleic acid comes along and binds the open strands, of course by hydrogen bonding, and these single-stranded nucleic acids are called primers. Next, the primers will act, they act as primers to attract a protein called DNA polymerase, an enzyme that copies DNA. So one cycle can generate two copies, the next can generate four, and the next can generate eight, and so on. So this technique is really powerful. With just a small amount of DNA left on a crime scene, it could be amplified and analyzed very easily. So the next technique up in the list would be the Gibson assembly. It's a really cool technique for binding DNA together. Say we have two strands that have an overlap, we can use an enzyme named next exonucleus to cleave the ends that are overlapping, and we can join them together, via hydrogen bonding of course. And there are a few enzymes that help the Gibson assembly complete itself by linking the DNA completely, uh, but I won't go into much detail about this. Just know that this technique is all about joining DNA that has an overlap together. But last but not least, DNA's backbone also has a group called the phosphate group. And this group contains a negative charge, and this is really important. So if we have this setup here, with two metal rods and a gel-like substance in between, one end is negative and one end is positive. DNA would actually move from the negative end to the positive end. 
since there is an electric field applied there. This is how we separate DNA by size. The heavier DNA remain behind and the smaller ones move forward. Because the gel is kind of like a net. The bigger you are, the harder you move. This method, gel electrophoresis, is actually a very good technique for classifying DNA. Because usually DNA comes in different lengths. We don't really need to sequence every single DNA in order to classify them. So this is just an example of uh, gel electrophoresis. And personally, I have used the first two techniques to amplify and combine some DNA fragments. And the last one, gel electrophoresis, is used to test those DNA, which ends up yielding the results I actually wanted for this experiment, particularly. This DNA, these DNA, are packaged into tubes into this black box. And this black box is going to be sent into space by the Blue Origin's New Shepard payload. So, yeah. Space isn't something that's really far away from us. In fact, it's actually coming sooner than you think. Isn't it weird, though, that nature can create something so complex as humans who are advanced enough to eventually understand what they're made of and transcend their home planet? Think about it. From a bunch of forces, a bunch of forces acting together by electromagnetism with orbitals overlapping somehow, all of that, all of that is the basis for incredibly complex beings known as us. So, I think we as a human race should be really, really proud of how far we came. From space dust to spacefarer. Thank you for listening. And I hope you have a great day. Subscribe, yada yada. Like, subscribe, turn on the notifications, do all the above. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a good day. Bye!